The impeachment inquiry continues in Washington, with House members causing disturbances in protest of a process they think is biased. And now we're getting a read on how people in Florida feel about it. The poll results coming from Northeast Florida's largest university. Vaping and opioids, those are two health topics connected to public policy. And we're talking with a city councilman in Jacksonville, who's also a doctor of pharmacy. And JEA continues to make headlines. We're to ask one of the newest members of city government her thoughts on the utility and its future, all on This Week in Jacksonville. So glad you're joining us this morning. Uh, to start with, how do people in Florida feel about the impeachment inquiry into President Trump? UNF released a poll this week conducted by the Public Opinion Research Lab on campus. The impeachment topic is split nearly down the middle. The issue of the president's overall performance, that leans against Donald Trump. UNF polled registered voters in the state asking about the House of Representatives and the formal impeachment inquiry. 48% approve, 47% disapprove, and it's clearly along party lines because 82% of the registered Democrats who are in the survey, they approve of the impeachment inquiry. And in a separate question about President Trump's job performance, also a fairly partisan response. 44% approve of how he's doing the job, 53% disapprove, and job approval is highest among Republicans, where 82% gave him the thumbs up as president. So this morning, uh, we are with Dr. Michael Bender from UNF, and he's our guest this morning, also helped do this poll. You led the research on this, uh, so let's just start with the broad one. Why? Why was this the polling question this time? Well, one thing we like to do when we're doing our statewide polls is always get a finger of the pulse of the public, where they feel about job approval. So that's why the job approval question was in there. The impeachment questions, I'm not sure if you've been paying attention yeah. to the news, but it's been out there the a last several weeks. A lot of people are talking weeks. about that one, right? This doesn't happen every day. It's an enormous deal. And the results are really interesting. You know, split down the middle here in Florida, not that big of a difference between approving of the inquiry. We asked a second question about impeach and remove, which is, you know, two steps down the line at this point. And it was almost the same. It was just, you know, a point less supportive. I think this really highlights where we are, not only as a state in Florida, but nationally. We're in two camps. It's partisan. Democrats are on one side, Republicans are on the other, and, and sadly, I think it's only going to get worse over the next 13 months. Well, we saw this instance that we showed video of a moment ago where conservative House members went and intentionally tried to get into a meeting that was closed to them, and really there's a lot of talk on both sides. This is the right thing to do. This is an unfair thing to do. Um, do we see that affecting how people feel about this whole process? Absolutely. Uh, Democrats are viewing this as a legitimate process that should have happened maybe a while ago. Republicans are viewing it as the illegitimate witch hunt and are doing all they can to prevent it and question the process because they're concerned about what some of the facts are and, and how that might look for the president. Yeah, one of the things that I love getting to talk to you about after you conduct a poll. So there's the data gathering part there is. and there's the what does it mean part. How do you look at that when we talk about that, that issue of what you just mentioned? people in, on partisan sides in their well, camp saying I, this is I right think, or wrong. I think we asked, we asked a second question later on about what's the most important problem facing the country, and that was part of the release as well. The two biggest issues were, unsurprisingly, health care and immigration, which are tops of the list of both parties. But what's really fascinating is the split there. 29% of registered Republicans think immigration is the biggest threat facing this country. 15% think it's health care of Republicans. Now, Democrats, if they want to make a move in 2020 in Florida, they're going to have to address that issue for Floridians that are Republicans to try to peel some away from Trump. Conversely, Republicans have to be worried about losing to on health care because if that's such a big issue and the Republicans really haven't had much of an answer at the national level about what to do about it. And I think those are two opportunities for the party to look at and maybe make gains on the other side. Yeah, well, f four years ago, five years ago, it was clear Republicans could campaign on yep. repeal and replace uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, the Obamacare. They repealed uh, some, not all. Right. So and that, what do we do that, now? Does that look like a weakness then for, in this case, President Trump? And well, the it, there's certainly a situation where most Democrats are putting forth a plan, whether it's Medicare for all or some re-strength version of Obamacare or somewhere in between. Uh, they have an idea. Uh, Trump has not really had much of a concrete plan moving forward. Yeah. 
one of the things that you asked in this poll that I picked up on, you also asked people about uh, the top Democrats facing not Donald Trump, but Mike Pence. Uh, that's an in case the president would be removed from office through the impeachment process. Right. And, and this was one of those things where sometimes it's interesting to see how people think that maybe not everybody's polling on. There's been a head to heads for the major candidates all the time. And we did that as well. And they were all very close. A couple of them were ahead, a couple of them were behind, but within the margin of error. All the, the two Democrats we asked about, just Biden and Warren, they were both plus almost 10 points. So they had a much bigger gap over Pence than they would over Trump. And I think part of that is obviously just name recognition and who Donald Trump is. But I also think it's a warning to Republicans that, you know, if it gets to the point where Pence is your nominee, uh, he's going to have a much harder road to go than Trump would. How did you decide on who to poll about in terms of the Democrats that you were asking sure. about a face off on? So we picked the top two candidates. And then we also added a couple others like Pete Buttigieg and also Kamala Harris. We did that for it's Florida. And we're really concerned about the general election. We were curious what how those votes might change if it was candidates with diversity. You know, Pete Buttigieg, a, a gay man, proud of it. How would that poll? Would, yeah. would, would there be some effects there? A woman of color, how would that poll? Would there be some effects there? And really, it didn't look like there was much. There was a little bit more uncertainty amongst the Democrats, but they tend to come home come election time anyway. So my big takeaway from the people that we talk to and, and, and data we have is, Whoever the Democrats nominate, it's going to be a razor-thin election here in Florida come 2020. It's, it always seems like it's a razor-thin election. It always in is. It's, this is going to be no different in 2020. It might be a little bit uglier. Yeah. So in, the, in terms of the methodology, uh, the number of people, about 1,000 people, is that right? No, we were down about a little 660, 670 okay. around well, from there. From all over Florida, not just northeast Across Florida. Across the state of Florida, we uh, stratify our sample by media market. So we get the percentage of folks out of our sample representative of the percentage of registered voters in each of the different media markets. So we get people from Miami and from Tallahassee and from Orlando and from the Southwest. Yeah. So maybe in our final minute here, uh, a more recent poll also released this week was just some statewide issues. What did you find there? People love Ron DeSantis. His job approval is 72 percent. These are numbers we haven't seen since Chris first got elected. These are big numbers. And, you know, there's probably a lot of reasons for that. Uh, he's you know, reached out to Democrats on some issues like climate control, teacher pay. Uh, he was you know, very strong against big sugar. Yeah. Even he went the, big on environment right big out of on the, the environment right out of, And also during the hurricane that we just you know, almost had a yeah. few weeks ago, he was reasonable. He wasn't out there telling people that they were going to die if they didn't evacuate. He's really come across as a reasonable leader in the state of Florida. And because of that, he's got great approval rating. Yeah. Well, we look forward to more research and the findings and the conclusions. And uh, great to see you. Thanks. Hey, always good to be here. A few weeks, we'll have some local stuff as well. Uh, uh, then you're coming back, right? <laughs> Sounds great. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Bender. And thanks for staying with us. You know, City Council, they had uh, one of those long meetings that they seem to be growing accustomed to this week. Leanna Cumber has almost four months under her belt representing District 5 in Jacksonville. She's joining us next, so stay with us. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. And one of the big issues discussed at this week's city council meeting in Jacksonville concerns going outside the Office of General Counsel to get the city council's own lawyer. And that's about the potential sale of JEA. One council member wanted to limit the amount spent on an attorney to half a million dollars. Instead, a bill to hire outside counsel was approved with a cost of up to $1.8 million. And City Council also discussed a proposal by State Representative Jason Fisher that would make the school superintendent a position appointed by the mayor. Now, Council had a resolution to formally oppose Fisher's measure that actually failed because there were nine votes for it, nine against. One City Council member had left earlier. That vote couldn't have been, or wouldn't have been, at least, a tie. So joining us right now, one of our City Council representatives, Leanna Cumber, Council member from District 5, and a lot to talk about here. Let's start just with this. So since you took your position, your role, a start of July, mm -hmm. it seems like there's been a lot going on. True? There has been a lot going on. And, um, you know, we tackled the budget in August, so that took up a lot of time. And um, so, and it just seems like the issues keep coming and we're tackling a lot of big policy issues. Yeah, so let's let's kind of lean in at this first one on the decision by council to get uh, an attorney outside the Office of General Counsel. This is something I think a lot of people, yeah, we know about consolidated government to a degree, but a lot of people maybe don't understand that structure where 
Office of General Counsel is the attorney for everybody in the city, but it, do you agree with this? You, your background is as an attorney, so do you agree with this idea? Let's get uh, another attorney to represent us when it comes to, or educate us when it comes to JEA. So first, um, I have the utmost faith in our OGC, our Office of General Counsel. I work with um, the lawyers there all the time. We will, counsel will need outside counsel, outside attorneys, at some point when we're talking about the details and the complexities of utility law and um, the regulatory issues that are going to come up at, with a potential um, recapitalization. What we're also going to need, in my estimation, are financial experts. Because if we really want to figure out um, the potential financial impact and what is the finances of JEA and so forth, the lawyers aren't really going to be able to answer those questions. What we need are um, outside fan financial experts. So we will need to do that. What happened on Tuesday was a little bit more nuanced, I think. Um, what happened on Tuesday is money was set aside to hire, at some point, attorneys. And my position on that was that money wasn't, it was kind of picked out a whole cloth. We just picked a number, 1.85. It wasn't, and as an attorney, and um, I try to be as fiscally responsible with taxpayer dollars as I can, um, I really think what we should have done is estimate the number of hours, billable hours, that we will need and negotiate with whatever law firm we choose on that rate. And then once that happens, then come and vote on a dollar amount that, yes, we may have to adjust later, but then it would actually be a dollar amount that we could all feel comfortable with that there was some backing. And so I opposed just setting an arbitrary number. Um, the council president has said he wants to vote on a law firm, hiring a law firm, and the actual law firm we're gonna hire, um, I believe in the next council meeting. We could fund them as well in that same council meeting. So um, I just think that the process, we kind of put the cart before the horse without knowing, without having really any backing on um, what it's really gonna cost. Yeah, It's a complicated issue, I think, but it's an emotional issue. When you talk about JEA, the potential for selling it, a year ago we were here and uh, Mayor Curry was saying, hey, I'm not gonna put forward anything to sell the JEA, but now it looks like certainly those are the steps that the CEO of JEA has been taking to at least explore this. Uh, where do you stand on that? Is it a good idea to explore this? Is this uh, something where we already know, hey, if we get a certain amount of money, that's gonna be good for the city? So um, I, don't, I don't think it's good to not explore what we have, and I don't have a visceral, I don't think privatization in general is necessarily a bad thing. Um, I, my dad is a Cuban refugee. I don't think the government can solve all problems. Um, and so what I think we need to do is look at what what is JEA worth? And the only way to do that is to find out what it's really worth on the marketplace, what people are willing to um, the, buy. The for. process we're in where we're getting Correct. bids for. Nine companies is where it's at now and saying we'd offer this month. That's, exactly. that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. And we will in not having, I'm someone who wants to have as much information as possible. And so it may be a good thing at the end of the day to recapitalize JEA. It may not be. And what that looks like, I have no idea. And that's why we're going through this process. And um, council is going to be having workshops to bring in experts to really understand what it means to have a public utility, what it means to have a private utility. You know, some places like Houston, at least they used to, allow you to choose where you wanted your energy to come from. So if you wanted wind energy, you paid a certain amount and so forth. There might be other ways we can do it. But without having the information, I simply can't say it's a good thing or it's a bad thing. So I think the process we're going through is actually the yeah. correct one to go through. Uh, let me shift topics just briefly here in our last couple of minutes for our segment. Uh, there's a process where a state representative, Jason Fisher in this case, has said, hey, we think, or he thinks, that the superintendent of schools in Duval County should be appointed by the mayor. That was something that was on the table this week where city council was going to say we're going to formally oppose that and that that didn't happen where do you stand on that issue so i again i don't have enough information to really understand whether it's a good thing to have an elected superintendent or a bad thing to have one um this resolution had no effect of law so did i get that wrong by the way it was for electing the superintendent not appointing the superintendent electing the okay, superintendent right it. and so um because now the superintendent's appointed um so I, I just don't know whether it's a good thing 
or a bad thing. Um, so I wasn't ready to oppose it without having really explored it. And it was a resolution that really didn't have any effect of law. And we have so, as you said, we have so much going through council that are, you know, that do have the effect of law and are impacting citizens every day. So I was really focused on that. So I think it was right to step back, pull it back, and then um, you know see what the delegation does and then, um, then see what the voters say. Yeah, we know that the delegation meeting, whether in Tallahassee, we've got our state representatives working committee weeks, legislative session starts in January. A lot can happen between now and then, uh, of course. Yeah. Leanna Cumber, thank you so much. Good to formally meet with you here on the, the set and we'll have you back, of course. Thank you for having me. All right, so Dr. Ron Salem is next on our show, also a city council member, but we're asking his expertise on the opioid and vaping crises. More just ahead, so stay with us in this week in Jackson. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. And Ron Salem is one of the at-large members of Jacksonville City Council, also a leading pharmacist in our area, Councilman Dr. Salem. Very good to have you back. Okay. One of the reasons that we thought we would want to talk again uh, on our show is because of what has been identified by the CDC as a crisis, if not an epidemic, of vaping. And you and I were just talking a moment ago, it seems like every day there's something new that comes out of this. Uh, what would you share with us in terms of this crisis going on in our community? Well, we've had one death in Florida and 33 hospitalizations directed to vaping. I went to the council president, Wilson, several weeks ago and said, I think we have a crisis in Jacksonville as well as across the country and would like to add this to our opioid task force process so we can get into it. Um, we are in the process of developing a local ordinance which would raise the age of tobacco and vaping products to 21 because from my standpoint the crisis really is amongst young people particularly and we're hearing that from the CDC and and, and what has been proposed or, or I guess uh, promoted is a better way to put it is hey vaping can be an alternative a safer alternative to smoking cigarettes or other tobacco products that's not necessarily what we're seeing right that's correct particularly in young people I had a a, a school person brought me a, a pillowcase full of vaping products sh that she From dumped the school? that she dumped on my desk and it was two weeks worth that they had confiscated so it is absolutely a crisis uh, approximately 25 to a third of our young people below the age of, uh, below the age of 18 are vaping and my concern is they get a product it's a bootleg product, right. may have marijuana in it or fentanyl or something else, and they kill themselves. Well, and so that's where the CDC is saying even this week, hey, what were the, the lung illnesses that we're seeing, the deaths that we're seeing seem to be connected to THC in the vaping product. Um, and, and help people out there understand, is that where users are going intentionally, or is it, is it like some of the opioid uh, things that we have, where it was a bootlegged product or it was not over-the-counter kind of stuff that, that gets them in trouble? Well, I, I think they're still investigating. Yeah. I, I think in some cases it was a bootleg product potentially purchased overseas, used, person got sick. My biggest concern is it appears like the people around 18 that are still in high school can buy these products. Then they bring them to school and pass them out to their fellow students. That appears to be where the young people are getting these products. So I think possibly by raising the age to 21, we can, we can stop at least some of that. Yeah. If, people, if adults want to use vaping products and they think it's helpful to stop smoking, you know, that's not my agenda. I'm really concerned about young people, deaths, getting sick. If I were a parent of a teenager, I'd be petrified right now. Yeah. We saw this this week that the Florida Surgeon General saying that patients uh, are vaping legal medical marijuana, but throwing out some caution there as well, saying, hey, you really need to talk to your doctor because there's still this uncertainty about a relatively new product, if you will, by vaping uh, this tobacco. Right. And I would be very concerned until this analysis is done and all these deaths across the country to determine the exact reason for that before I'd be vaping marijuana. Yeah. Where do we stand in the opioid crisis? I know it's the Jacksonville has been kind of leading edge for the state of Florida and saying we are going to get involved. 
uh, and you know, one of the people on city council before you had got started that process. That's correct. Bill Gulliford kicked off yeah. this process approximately two years ago. Our anniversary is coming up in November. Uh, we've had about a thousand. 60 people we've transported OD'd into the four emergency rooms that are contracted with us. Approximately 60% of those, 600, um, decided they wanted to receive treatment, mm. either inpatient or outpatient. Yeah, and that's a big part of that. They've got to say, yes, I want the help. And these are people that just OD'd and maybe got Narcan that reversed their, over, their, their right. overdose. And now we're sitting there with a peer, um, a peer saying, do you want help? Yeah. And we've only had five people that have entered the program that have expired. No kidding. Okay, so clearly saving lives. And that was at the outset, hey, we've got to find a way to do that to keep people from losing their life and hopefully provide that treatment that, that solves the problem a little bit. That is the sole purpose of that program is really just to save their life, get them into treatment. Um, I'm asking the state attorney and the sheriff to get engaged in our committee so we can start looking at other ways that we can reduce these drugs in our community so we don't have people coming in in the emergency room. Yeah, I, and I'm sure for the other uh, members of city council, for city government, it helps to have your expertise uh, as part of that. I know it helps us as citizens understand a little bit more hearing your expertise. Dr. Salem, thank you so much. Appreciate uh, sharing some of that. This Kent, morning. it's great to be back. All right. And next week, uh, one of our guests is State Representative Clay Yarborough. He's moving legislation about required reading before a marriage license gets issued. We're also working to bring you some special interviews ahead of Veterans Day. This week in Jacksonville airs each Sunday morning at this time. I'm Kent Justice. Thanks for watching on air on Channel 4 and the CW17. And you can find us online at news4jacks.com. More people in Northeast Florida and South Georgia get their news from News 4 Jax than anywhere else.